Ah, okay. We're all back. Hi everyone, welcome to this week's Learning Space. I'm your host, Nicole Gallucci, a postdoc with CosmoQuest. Uh, and I am joined this week by Tom Walkinshaw. So, hello. Hi. Uh, we are going to be talking about the Pocket Cube, which is a project uh, for sending satellites into space for a reasonably priced budget. Um, first, I uh, have a few announcement type things to do. Uh, unfortunately, my co-host Georgia Bracey is not here. She's on her way back from a conference in Vegas. <laughs> So go Georgia. Um, and I have a little activity that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, I started sharing some of the activities I got as part of the Astronomy Ambassadors Program with the American Astronomical Society and Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Uh, this one, I think, uh, pertains well to this week's show topic. It's called How High Up is Space? Um, and I will share a link to the PDF on the ASP, Astronomical Society of the Pacific website. Um, at its heart, it's basically uh, getting your students to do ratios, which, you know, everyone loves. Uh, <laughs> uh, getting them to do ratios, but they end up building, and you can actually build a physical model out of this, of, of a scale model of how high things are up above the Earth's surface. So I'll share the PDF link to this in the event page, um, and then we'll include it in the show notes afterwards as well. Uh, so you guys know you can always comment uh, ask questions, say hello, uh, using the Q&A app for Google Hangouts, using the event pages, uh, the one with the video and the one with the event. Uh, um, and I'll also try and watch the YouTube comments as well, so you guys can ask questions throughout the show. Um, and I started to fill out this activity a little bit. Uh, so it starts, it starts you with Mount Everest. So imagining Mount Everest is the width of a pencil. So, you know, all those mountain climbers out there, <laughs> here is your mountain, it's the width of a pencil, is Mount Everest in this scale model. And it gives you uh, the heights at uh, some other things, so, so the top of the stratosphere, uh, where meteors burn up, where NASA says you get your astronaut wings, um, gives it in kilometers and miles, and your students have to figure out that height in this scale model, so given centimeters or, unfortunately, we're still in the U.S., inches, but we'll use centimeters because we're cool. Um, so, for example, if the height of Mount Everest was, you know, width of this pencil, uh, I went through and calculated that the top of the stratosphere, so most of the Earth's atmosphere, is about four centimeters above that. So I've got a shiny NASA ruler, and turn it the right way, four centimeters above that bottom. You see where the four is? That's how high the Earth's atmosphere is. Uh, if you want to get out to uh, the Kármán line, which is the international boundary of space, that is eight centimeters. So where's eight on here? Here's eight centimeters. So Mount Everest is a pencil. You're in space at eight centimeters. The Hubble Space Telescope, uh, if you keep going out, that ends up being 44.5 centimeters on this scale. So you'd need a second ruler, and you could have your students draw a chart on the wall, um, or try and find classroom objects that are th that, that size. Uh, can you extend it to uh, have them figure out the diameter of the Earth in that scale and see if that'll fit in your classroom? Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do with that. It has a pretty wide age range um, as a classroom activity because you can either give them the numbers and have them build the model, or have it as a math activity, have them figure it out, um, and then uh, build it and discuss it. So that's How High Up is Space. That's our, our featured activity of the week. Uh, and it is, um, so it's, it's available from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, and it's uh, written by Andrew Frackway. So um, yeah, so that's our activity. Hope you guys uh, get a chance to try that out with your students. Uh, we have a hello from Tom Nathy. Hello. Uh, it was good to see you in the virtual star party last week. Uh, I was actually in the virtual star party for once. That was fun. So, yay. Uh, so, everybody else out there, uh, feel free to say hello and ask questions as we go along. I'm going to get into our main topic now with, with Tom. Um, so, welcome to the show. You are the founder of Pocket Cube, and this seemed really cool, and I wanted to learn all about it. So, maybe first you can start off with what's the, the quick elevator pitch. What is Pocket Cube? So basically PocketCube is a, a 5 centimeter cube satellite. Um, I'm not actually the creator of PocketCube, that's Bob Twix, uh, formerly of Stanford. Uh, we're, we're the shop, but yeah, 5 centimeters, yeah. <laughs> Pretty small. Um, you can pack a lot of uh, electronics in a small space these days, so 
essentially the pitch is that uh, traditional CubeSats probably cost about the same as a house and CubeSats cost roughly the same as a car to build and launch. So you're, you're looking at about a sixth of the overall cost mm -hmm. and that's primarily savings on launch. So go smaller, go cheaper um, and get launch as opposed to um, building it sitting in your coffee table. So that's, that's sort of the, the overview I guess. So. Yeah. So you got, you started this as, uh, through a Kickstarter campaign last year? Yeah, well that was yeah that was the sort of the big launch that we had. We uh, we raised about five thousand US dollars, um, and we got our first customers for Pocket Cube, which was really exciting. Kind of validated that um, we we're onto something. Uh, Kickstarter's always crazy because you, you you want somebody to get behind you. So you don't want to be that guy who sticks out there and nothing happens. So, yeah. Um, so we managed to get our first two customers, and uh, we're we're shipping hopefully end of this week, start next week, our first. Uh, play hardware, which is really exciting. Um, so it's a lot of stress. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. So, so where is the hardware made? Uh, so we manufacture it in Glasgow. So we're based in Glasgow, Scotland, um, and uh, we have we're based in a, a fab lab, which came out of MIT. So the basic premise there is that uh, we have this access to this community lab with 3D printers, laser cutters. CNC mills, like cutting edge technology, and we just pay a, a fairly low cost membership to have access to all that equipment. So, I mean, it's a great place to start a company. Uh, so, we do our manufacturing predominantly in house uh, for that, um, that sort of stuff. So. Cool. So, uh, what were, so, so you've had a few previous customers. Uh, what kind of satellites did they build? So yeah, so there's, there's four pocket cubes on orbit just now, so mm -hmm. that's quite exciting. Uh, three of them are operational, one of them didn't quite work, which is a bit annoying. Um, oh. So we, we kind of came in after them. It was more coincidence that we showed up at the same time. Uh, we probably get too much credit for kind of jumping in at the right time. Um, because we, we finished our Kickstarter at the end of October, and then these guys flew um, middle of November, so it wow. worked out quite well. And it had been delayed for about a year and a half. Um, so it's just coincidence rather than any sort of great timing. Um, so people have flown things like um, sort of small cameras, um, thrusters, so new technology for thrusting, uh, for maneuvering, um, reaction wheels for orienting spacecraft, um, sensors for measuring things like um, X-ray bursts. Uh, mm. Somebody flew two sun sensors. Um, so predominantly technology. Uh, and uh, science experiments, that's the sort of two camps mainly. And there was also another satellite that got flown called $50 sat, which didn't have a payload, but it cost them about, some, it depends who you talk to, but they reckon they're probably about £200 for, or $200 for the electronics uh, and solar panels, and maybe a wee bit more for the structures, but all in probably less than $1,000. And wow. it's just the world's smallest satellite, the world's uh, Yes, world's smallest operational satellite and the world's cheapest operational satellite, so kind of world breaking. It's kind of cool, so and yeah, it's pretty. pretty yeah, cool. that that's well within crowdfunding range, right? Somebody doing a thousand dollar, few thousand dollar satellite. Yeah, and the kind of cool thing there as well is that um, so you can go out and listen to it if you have the sort of right radio gear. You can go out and you can track it online and work it when it's going overhead and listen to it. Beep. It's kind of like kind of modern day Sputnik, I guess. Um, oh, it's cool. So yeah, um, so it passes overhead every point, I think, once a day or something like that. I'm not sure exactly, it depends where you are. Um, and they also open source the designs, so you can go on their website and um, build one yourself. So uh, so we sell the structures um, for the spacecraft, but they have open source PCBs. So if you quite like soldering and quite like getting your hands started, you can um, Make your own fifty dollars that, which is kind of cool. Um, and because I mean, just now we're sort of um, we're very early on. I mean, it's like the first ones were launched launched just last year, mm -hmm. so there's an awful lot of parts. So just now it's very much DIY until more commercial companies come on board and offer you know battery packs, processors, that sort of things. Sure. Now, can you um, Maybe walk us through if 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 I have a des an idea for um, a satellite, what would someone do? They have an idea for a satellite. They don't have any um, satellite technical experience. They come to you, and and what do they do? 
Yes. Yeah, so, um, so we kind of we are on our website. We kind of spot it there in the main. And actually, you have to have some sort of. Obviously, you need to do something so there'd be a reason behind it. So we try and work out what the reason is, um, whether it's practical. Because I mean, it's good to be cheap, but as you go smaller, you lose capability. So if it needs to go beep, or it needs to maybe have a small camera or a small sensor, then that's probably within the range of a pocket project. If it's something like. Um, High resolution imaging on the ground, you probably need something bigger. Mm-hmm. So we sort of work out like where are they coming from, what's their sort of their needs. Um, and the website we sort of split it down into the sort of different stages. So you need to raise your funding, first of all, uh, otherwise you're not going to build anything. So uh, we've done a Kickstarter and we're going to put out some videos on how to successfully crowdfund, hopefully, and um, give some sort of best practices. Um, and they have been three or four satellites crowdfunded now, so that's a, a viable option. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of design, we have um, the first commercial part, so we sell the structures. So obviously, kind of sell promote here, but I'd say buy a structure from us because you know we're the, we're the only ones in the market just now. And, uh, but yeah, uh, you can buy essentially the box, um, and uh, most satellites are fairly standard, as in um, this, so they're they're sort of an incremental unit. So you have a one pocket cube, which is a five centimeter cube. Mm-hmm. And then you have a one and a half and a two and a half, so it's just you just add it up. So it's um, I think it's just over seven and a half, and then just over ten centimeters, and then you can go all the way up to about two and a half. So some of the ones that got launched were two and a half units or two p two and a half p's. So um, sort of pick your size, um, order your structure from us. Uh, you can buy solar panels. Uh, we're looking to bring some of them out soon. Um, so you need to generate power of some sort. Um, and then on the insides, you need um, a power system, uh, like computer, uh, and some sort of communication. So we're uh, working with a company in the States to bring out a radio kit soon. So that was the start of March, we're bringing that out on the website. Um, and then your payloads, so that's kind of what most people probably get excited about. Is So you have your, your basic bus, which is kind of the sort of the unloved stuff, I guess. But the payloads, what do you want to fly? So do you want to fly a camera? Do you want to fly a sensor, do you want to fly something like a propulsion, do you want to fly a deer orbit sail, um, so that's kind of the cool stuff, so it really just depends, mm-hmm. um, and we're also sort of working on launch opportunities, so obviously you want to get it launched, because otherwise... You can't just use like, a slingshot, I, yeah, yeah, you need yeah, a rocket. <laughs> uh, yeah, you need a big slingshot, um, a really big <laughs> slingshot. Um, so I mean, we're kind of focused on orbit, um, a lot of people have done like CANSATs and um, chipsets and other things which haven't been launched to orbit, and you know they're kind of cool. And you know, you maybe get a nice day out and fire a rocket and stuff. Um, the kind of cool thing about pop cubes is that you're up probably a bit longer, so you're in orbit, so you're doing Mach 25 um, and orbit the Earth every day. Um, the ones that went up just now are about 15 years, I think, 15, 16 years in orbit, um, wow. and cost less than an SUV, so. That's pretty good mileage. That's, <laughs> That's actually probably the best. That's a lot mileage. of mileage. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, cost per mile is pretty low, so uh, I should be on your marketing line actually. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, so yeah, we're we're working with brokers. So the first four were launched in a Dnieper, which was a um, a converted ICBM. Um, wow. So yeah, so actually the Russians had all these nukes left over from. Uh, End of the Cold War era. Thankfully, they never used them, um, and you know they're quite capitalist. So you know why leave them in a silo when you could sell them to the Yanks or the Europeans? Make a bit money. A much better use. This is a yeah. much better use of those rockets. <laughs> well, yeah, it's been rebranded. It's called the, the, the Dnieper just now, but it used to be called the SS Satan. So it's it's kind of yeah, I know. Wow. <laughs> Do you want to have pocket cube launch in an SSC? SSC, yeah. there you go. <laughs> but yeah, so so I mean it's quite a good track record and um, they broke the world record last time. So what you're seeing is lots of small satellites kind of get on the bus, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. you, you have lots of tiny satellites on one big massive rocket and that's how the economics works out because you essentially group, it's sort of, yeah. guess group one per satellite, I guess you sort of spread out the cost between lots of different parties. and. Uh, 32 in the last one, and it's going to be more world records, I think, coming up soon. So that's very cool. 
Um, so what is the hardware like? I can show some pictures. Like, what is, like, the starting price of uh, the satellite body? What are you getting? So, yeah, so we are since uh, 499 uh, US, for US dollars. Uh, and we're looking to do free shipping as well. Um, so that we are shipping the first two this week. And you can go online and buy it with a credit card, which is fairly unusual in the space industry. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, you have to talk to a guy who talks to a guy and then you might get a price that, you know, depends on who you are. But we're fairly straightforward. You can buy it online. Um, we'll pretty much sell them to anyone as so long as you're not under some uh, dictatorship or something like that. And it's export regulations against that. Um, we're a wee bit better in the UK than the US is quite bad for exporting technology because they're not keen to export it. But uh, we're yeah, keen to export it. Yeah, <laughs> we're in a nice location. So you can go online, you can buy it, we'll ship it out to you. Um, you can start dreaming up your designs. Um, and uh, we're developing a kind of mentoring service as well. So the sort of idea there is that what we're finding is like a lot of people think oh, that's quite cool, Bob Satley. Um, maybe get our high school to do it, or maybe get a university to do it. It's a kind of class project. Um, but generally speaking, they have no experience. Um, so you're starting from like zero. Um, so basically, we have like a, a service where uh, we've partnered up with um, a company who has maybe about 20 or 30 years experience in building smaller satellites. And they put together a curriculum whereby you can get calls like this every every week and phone them up and call them um, as a kind of outsource mentor, an outsource kind of um, I'm not sure the best terminology, but sort of, you know, sort of a guru, a lecturer, a mentor, yeah. um, something like that, so that you, you have some sort of, you know, am I doing this right? Am I doing this wrong? And there are a lot of kind of pitfalls as well. I mean, obviously, um, you can't just follow any sort of design. It has to conform to a standard, and it has to survive a bunch of testing. Um, so obviously, for the first time you're doing that, that's quite, you know, daunting, especially if you have no guidance. If you have guidance, then it's great. So it's, that's more sort of a guiding service. So. This this sounds like an amazing. Um, you could do uh, an engineering project for a student. You pair them up with a mentor, and have them build the. I mean, building the components and going through the testing like that is so important as as job skills for the industry. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of it's been CubeSat's been quite popular, um, and it's for mainly the larger universities who have mm -hmm. the bigger budgets, or NASA right. do do some free launches. Um, I mean, you can't get them in Europe, obviously, and you can't get them in any other sort of part of the world. Um, so there's a lot of kind of underserved parts there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the first high schooler satellite got launched in um, November, sort of same around the same time as our cubes got launched. Um, so basically, if you're trying to get into Stanford or MIT, and they, they sort of say, what have you done? And you say, well, I bought a satellite into an orbit. Um, you're probably going to get in over the guy who hasn't. So. Yeah. You know, it's kind of a sort of skills inflation that's going on, which is, you know, if that's the passing grade to get into MIT or something, then, you know, that's kind of cool. And uh, it's, it's a school in uh, Brazil who are building their own uh, pop cube just now. Um, and I think they're looking to launch kind of end this year, start next year. Oh, wow. um, so you're starting to see small, like, high schooler projects almost. I mean, it's not crazy cost. I mean, it's literally less than a teacher's salary for a year, which, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, is what, less than 5% of their budget usually. So, um, so I mean, I think it's kind of in that ballpark, and, you know, we have to show that it's doable and that these guys can build it and it works. So there's a lot of things still to prove, but generally speaking, um, the barriers are a lot lower than everywhere. And we're trying to, that's our kind of focus, is to make it as, probably the wrong terminology, but easy. There's a lot of focus in the space industry on making things hard, making things not like standardized, making things really bespoke. And uh, it's mainly to feather everyone's on this, which, you know, it's not good if you want to get wide access and participation. So, you know, we think this has potential to get, you know, hundreds of groups interested and, you know, we'd like to see lots of people get involved and start their projects and we'll try and be as helpful as we can. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we are. So we have a question from, from Tom um, related to, to what you were just mentioning. Does the user-supplied electronics, do, do this, the user-supplied electronics need to be space-rated 
Um, or can it just be any electronics that can withstand the launch and the environment? Is there a specific rating system, or is it just a certain test that you have to go through? Yeah, so like radiation hardening and that sort of thing. Um, so the answer is um, vibrations, the thing that usually breaks it. So if it's about the vibration test, then usually you're good for launch. Um, okay. So 50 dollar sat was all off the shelf. Um, they ordered it online and they've got their parts in the post um, from standard electronics providers. Um, it's always safer to go with people who um, like providers. Um, just now there isn't an awful lot of them in Pocket Cube because it's so new. So we're trying to create a development community. Mm -hmm. Kind of like you have like apps for the App Store. You have people who develop for Pocket Cube and sell their parts. And that's another way to finance your own Pocket Cube project. We hope. Um, but for testing, I mean, if you can survive the thermal and the vibration test, usually you're good. And fifty dollars that proved that um, stuff you can buy off digital heat works. So you know, um, so the answer is usually if you test it enough times and it doesn't break, then get back go and see what happens. It's, it's kind of a change in the attitude as well that we're trying to get across. Is like um, just like rapid iteration and trying things. So a lot of times people don't know. So one of my friends um, from Surrey uh, built uh, world's first phone satellite. So it had a Nexus, um, can't remember the type, Nexus 7 from Google. So it's the world's first smartphone to fly in space, and it was the processor for Strand 1, which is kind of cool. Um, the problem was that by the time they flew it, which was three years after they designed it, um, they brought out like three new versions or four new versions of that phone. So like the stuff you could buy in the shop was more powerful than what was on his satellite by quite some margin. Um, yeah. And they couldn't upgrade it because they had a, a, a mold for that size, uh, that shape and that size, and phones tend to change size. So there's things like that that, you know, we'd like to see people find like Raspberry Pis and um, that new Intel Edison chip and just like things that come off the shelf and like literally, right, we'll try it in a, a pocket cube. We see if it works, and if it doesn't work, it's not the end of the world because we tried it, and you know we'll learn. And um, if it does happen to work, you know that may enable technology to go on a few leaps and bounds. So there's a lot of kind of cool technologies around propulsion and uh, battery storage and deployables and things that could just get tested. And you know if two or three of them work, then great. I mean there's the standards now. So yeah, no, that that's a great way. I I think that's a great way of doing things. Um, the project I worked on as a grad student was a radio telescope. They're building out to 128 antennas now, but we started with four. And we tested the crap out of those four, because that's, you know, like you said, if, you, if it goes wrong, it's okay. It's, it's not a huge scale. So that's a yeah. great, great, great philosophy, I think. <laughs> you can't really do that on James Webb, though. So it's, no. it's the difference between us and them is yes. that they have to succeed no matter what. Mm -hmm. We like go down in a blaze of glory. Nobody really cares because it's a high school or a university project that no one's ever heard of usually. Right. So you know, if it doesn't power up, then you know, it's not the end of the world. But if it Those kids up, would be devastated. But yeah. Yeah. It's not. Well, yeah. Um, but they learned something in the process. Yeah. That's important too. <laughs> learn perseverance. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you learn perseverance. So yeah. Uh, um, now I noticed in one of the tweets from Pocket Cube. Um, the, the quote, uh, satellite in every classroom. Is this a yeah. long-term vision that you have? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's completely doable. I mean, it's um, probably, I mean, I've been talking to people who are in sort of startup scenes and they think I'm maybe 10 years ahead of what I should be doing, but it's probably a bit ahead of the curve. Um, yeah. But I mean, that's how computers started out. Computers started out is like, what, you're going to have a computer in a classroom? Are you crazy? Do you know what I mean? Um, but you know, eventually they started getting smaller and smaller, and then they started having applications. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say these like direct analogies. It's obviously it's a different sort of pro program, a uh, different thing for a different sort of solution. But you know, I mean, I'd like to see every university in Scotland build one, and there's 15 universities in Scotland, um, and I think that would, you can maybe get 300 people who are graduated having experience in building satellites, and you know, what are they going to build? Are they going to start the next? You know. Um, SpaceX or whatever, you know, that's where I'd sort of see, you know, it's, it's just getting people experience and, you know, the barriers aren't there anymore. It's maybe more a kind of political thing and just raising, banging the drum and, you know, it took quite a long time for CubeSat to build, become an overnight success that has uh, in recent years. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it'd be kind of cool to get one in every classroom. I mean, there's a lot of classrooms out there, so that's quite a big challenge. So, but you know, if we, we've got them in like a few people who are building today in classrooms, so there's no reason why that can fail. If yeah. people got behind it, we get inquiries all over the place. We get inquiries from Ecuador and Brazil and Argentina and India, and you know, it's it's kind of like one or two students who randomly heard about us through some sort of activity. Kind of, that's kind of cool, you know, we could do this in our university, our high school, our college, whatever. Um, and to be honest, there's not a lot of what's stopping them. They just need sort of perseverance and okay. determination and ability to, to sort, of, sort of seize the opportunity. So. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah, so any teachers watching, if you've been thinking about <laughs> building a satellite, if you dreamed yeah. about building, I, I know a couple teachers locally here that would just jump on that. So <laughs> let's spread the word. Oh, yep. we have a, another question from Tom. What about communicating with the satellite? Who handles that? Is that is that handled by the team? Yeah. So just now it's handled by the team. So you can get a fairly small. You need a, a ham radio license, mm -hmm. uh, or you need someone, or you need to be friends with one. That's the two options. Uh, um, uh, usually it's easier to be friends with one because there's, there's a lot of them out there. Yes. Or, Every, everybody's got to have a ham radio operator as a friend. I. I yeah, <laughs> I'm biased, but I do. <laughs> yeah, but a chance could borrow your ham radio set. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, you can do some uh, exams and stuff to to pass that, mm -hmm. um, and you get your own call sign and things like that. Um, or um, you can work with someone who does have one already in place, which is probably slightly easier. Uh, it depends how authentic you want to make the learning experience, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, depends what's. I mean, you could have someone do that. You could have someone do the soldering. You could have somebody. Yeah, doing a different part of it. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So, I mean, just now the teams are, there's a big dish in Moorhead, which is being used mm -hmm. uh, by the guys in Kentucky who flew uh, T Local Cube, which is one of the CubeSats, uh, one of the pop cubes, rather. Um, there's some German guys who, who made a homemade device, and that's talking to them. Uh, they're on Sally. Um, uh, and the 50 dollars sat guys who all have their own, they're all ham radio guys. So that's their background. Um, so they're more from the radio world. So they've bought their own gear, um, and I think you can do it fairly cheap. I mean, it's still something we we need to explore and make easier. You know, sort of document it out. So there's a, a sort of easy plan to follow. Um, but it's been done a lot of times for the CubeSats. So I mean, I think it's viable that you could talk to it from your own ground station, as long as you have the right permits and stuff. I mean, mm. I don't think that's it depends where you are in the world because it's different regulations. But generally speaking, amateur radio bands um, are how, the way to go. Very cool. I hope that answers this question. Yeah, yeah, no, I think so. Um, also, uh, you mentioned a an upcoming hack hackathon. Uh, yeah. It's kind of a concept we've talked about on the show before, and I, I love going to conferences where there's a hack day. Um, the American Astronomical Society is starting to have them at their conferences. Uh, Dot Astronomy has them. Uh, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, ironically, we're not organizing it, so... <laughs> okay, but you're taking part in it. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, we're definitely, we're looking to help them out, and um, it's been run by Professor Bob Twiggs, who invented PopCube and CubeSat, and was formerly Space, in, Space Systems Engineering at Stanford. Um, so it's in Mountain View uh, in April time, so mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of cool that it's the world's first PopCube hackathon. Uh, and we're going to try and get there. We're based in Glasgow, so it's a bit of a commute. Yeah. And ironically, I was in the building it was like only a couple of months ago, so I know exactly where it is. So just across from Google, actually. So, um, so yeah. I mean, basically, I think the sort of idea behind it is to um, get people just uh, trying things out over a kind of weekend period, uh, fairly low cost. You try a bunch of designs. You learn a wee bit about pop, a wee bit of salads. And you hopefully go away inspired to spread the word or build your own or try and build a proper flight one or something like that. And that's the sort of idea behind it. And Bob's really passionate about STEM education and um, he's a sort of a total visionary in his field. And um, he's like one of the most influential guys in space when all these different polls come out. So, so he's got a good track record. And uh, I think that's his kind of sort of mantra there. So. So yeah, if you're in the mountain, you go along, uh, check it out. Where is this? Where's this hackathon happening? I... Uh, mountain View. It's uh, in okay. sort of the area. Um, yeah. 
just kind of it's literally just down from Google and NASA Ames in that right. part of the world. Um, just in the one one. So yeah. that's a good place. <laughs> it's a good place yeah. to have. So. It's, really, it's nice weather. I mean, Scotland's not like that, so. Yeah, it is nice weather. <laughs> like rain clouds over here. So. Oh, it gives you radio astronomy. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So, what is your what is your background? Um, what got you involved in this in the first place? Yeah, it's kind of a funny story. It's a long one. Um, I mean, I come from a business background of all things, so I'm not really. Uh, uh, I've done business at university and. Um, I mean, I quite liked it. I mean, I thought it was kind of cool, and I thought it would be a smart way to get a job going into business. Um, and um, yeah, we have a local company in Glasgow called Clydespace, who uh, the founder of that talk and basically said, you know, I was obviously aware of space and I was a, a fan of space, um, huge fan of like Elon Musk and SpaceX and Tesla and all the things he's doing. And it's really kind of sort of, you know, I think he'll go down in history. Um, but uh, one of the local guys who had quite a successful company doing CubeSats sort of done a talk saying that, you know, why do we not have more entrepreneurs in Glasgow doing this? And um, so, yeah, I kind of thought, well, why not? So we tried around a few other ideas and eventually we got onto this and we talked to a few people in the industry and it seemed like a decent opportunity to go for. Um, so we started building prototypes maybe about a year ago. Um, and then I quit my job, which is a bit scary, and we took on our first employee as well. So, so we're starting to look like a real company eventually, slowly but surely. So, it's it's always tricky when you're starting out because startups are pretty tough to get off the ground. But hopefully, we've yeah. got enough wind in our sails that we can uh, spread the word and you know do well. So, um, but yeah, business background, and I would say probably more kind of part of the maker movement than anything mm -hmm. else. So. Um, joined the local fab lab, uh, learned all about sort of making technologies and sort of applied, you know, I've kind of got business backgrounds, so I can make a bunch of prototypes, kind of make a business here, kind of do this rather than financial services or something like that. So, so yeah, totally different career path than most people will get. So maker businessman, a maker businessman with an interest in space. <laughs> Very much, yeah. That's the <laughs> overall picture. Pretty much. Very cool. Um, we have another question, um, also from Tom Nathy. Are these satellites in a low enough orbit that they re-enter on their own, uh, or do you need to do orbit? Do you need to deorbit them at the end of their lifetime? Yes. So basically, you're only allowed 25 years in orbit from the United Nations. Um, oh, wow. Yes. There's a limit. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure how well it's put like enforced. I mean, if you have a satellite up for 26 years, I'm not sure you can do much. But you wouldn't really want to follow the United Nations. So. People tend to, you know, sort of play by the rules. Um, so generally speaking, you're only like 25 years anyway. Um, so you have to. Um, the highest you can really go up is about 700 kilometers um, up. Uh, I don't know what that is in your scale. Uh, uh, it's it's a little bit above the Hubble Space Telescope. So about two of these rulers. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, uh, the thing with these is that they they fall out of the sky fairly quick because they're quite small and mm -hmm. uh, they're drag. I mean. The ones that flew had um, uh, drag wings so that they could increase their cross section, essentially meaning that they could deorbit quicker. Okay. Um, so, I mean, you can take propulsion on board, and some CubeSats and pocket tubes have. Um, but to be honest, as long as you're in a low enough orbit, and it depends, I mean, you can go anywhere from about 300 up to 700. Mm -hmm. um, and it depends on a whole bunch of different factors, like the solar cycle, where we are, solar minimum, solar maximum. That sort of thing. Um, but roughly speaking, most of them are in within 25 years. There's nothing that I know of would be longer than that. Okay. So they so they so they do orbit on their own. But there was at least one that you said has propulsion system on it. Yes. So one of the pocket tubes did take um, four pulse plasma thrusters on board. Uh, a small pocket tube called Ren, which is one of the smallest pocket tubes or one of the smallest satellites ever to fly. Um, but it didn't. It didn't work. So the, the beacon worked, but the uh, satellite didn't boot up. So a wee bit unfortunate. Uh, it worked in the lab pretty well. Um, oh, that's that didn't go. Okay. So, yeah. But I think they're they're planning a follow up. I think. I think it's going to be a round two or something like that. So okay. they've done a Kickstarter, but it didn't get funded. So I think they raised about seven thousand dollars or something, but they needed a wee bit more. So mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's kind of cool technology as well. And, 
I mean, you don't have to take propulsion so long as you're under 25 years. But you know, if you want to, you can. If you want to test a a deorbit sail, then you know that's probably a good place to do so. so. Sure. So the that's short a- answer. Yeah, so it, it's a lot. It's it's a lot smaller. It's 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 small in comparison to the amount of stuff that hits Earth from space anyway every day. So yeah. Yeah, it's like several tons get hit from space or something yeah. like that. And, yeah, that know. burns up. So yeah, it, it's yeah, fine. really fit in your pocket sort of size thing. So. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, Nancy Graziano just joining us, uh, asking if you can maybe talk a little bit more about what the um, the pocket cubes that already went up are doing. So you mentioned cameras and sensors. Can you talk a little bit more about what they do? Yeah. So um, so three out of the four of them are operational. Unfortunately, the really good one, or the really advanced one, I shouldn't say the really good one. That's kind of bad. Um, the really advanced one didn't work. Uh, yeah. Or they couldn't get it from the ground. I think the software had a glitch or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other ones, fifty dollars that is beeping out Morse codes, um, and it, it's basically a beacon on how high its battery voltages are, um, which isn't the most exciting thing. But to be honest, it was fairly cheap. You know, yeah. like two hundred dollars something. So, you know, um, so that was more proof of concept, and it's it's still working after nearly three months. You know, so um, it's pretty impressive. This is uh, called fifty other, dollars set. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> The internal electronics cost less than fifty dollars. Wow! So, um, and it's all open source, so you can get the designs online. Okay. Uh, and they've even got like a part list of where they bought them from and stuff. So um, online and stuff. So uh, it's pretty impressive stuff. Um, the other two, one was called T Logo Cube, which um, I believe was for X-rays or detecting X-rays in low Earth orbit, um, and uh, it had had some uh, basic computer programming language uh, called uh, U-Logo, I think it was, which okay. was to get um, kids coding and then using that on satellites. So it's kind of to get people more interested in coding. The way to keep people interested in coding was you're building satellites or going to space. That's kind of cool. So, you know, yeah. it's kind of to get a sort of carrot in the stick sort of thing. Um, the other one was Cube Scout, which um, flew to find sun sensors, uh, which I think were Technology is a technology testbed for larger satellites. The idea is that you you fly your sensor and then it's going to be useful in a I don't know a million pound mission or a ten million dollar mission or a hundred million dollar mission. But you have to get the the flight heritage to prove that it's useful mm-hmm. because you're not like if you want to fly something in Hubble and it's never flown before or like the technology's never flown before, it's going to be a tough sell. So you know if you can say you've got you know five satellites or five pop cubes or whatever that have flown this technology and you're fairly confident and you know that may cost you less than I don't know a hundred grand or something to just get that heritage and then that's when you make the mistakes as opposed to when it's like mission critical yeah, um, yeah. because the problem in the space industry is I guess a lot of people don't know they are like there are issues I mean things like negative feedback loops where you can't fly anything unless it's flown before so like it's it's kind of self fulfilling thing. It's like well, we can't fly it because we don't have heritage on it, so it can get flown. We can't so, get started because we yeah. can't get started. Yeah. So, so I mean, like if the space industry got close to Moore's law, then it would be like head and shoulders of where it is today. And our goal is just to get close to the curve. But we can just get close to the curve. It'll be a huge improvement over the status quo. So yeah. yeah. Um, so I mean, there are a few kind of interesting payloads. Um, the ones that are going up, hopefully. The next batch, I don't know when they'll go exactly, but some people are doing um, like tracking from migrating birds. So um, it's a guy in Spain, I think, it is or Italy, um, to track the uh, migration patterns. Uh, so they you know where to put like turbines and stuff, and um, obviously you don't put that on a migration route. Um, so it's things like that, um, and a few other sort of DIY efforts that are going on, which are actually people in a garage and people in sheds. Um, Making satellites, uh, and it's all kind of making movement there as well, which is kind of cool. Um, and it's like having a radio guy as well, who just went to sort of send the radio signals up and beat the back. So, yeah. um, so they are quite a few different people working on things. So, so hopefully that's kind of answers. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, I know uh, sort of idea that Fraser Kane from Astronomy Cast uh, and all her other Hangouts University today. 
um, has been talking about with some uh, and Pamela Gay and and bunch and Phil Plain. I think they've all been talking about. We want to put up a camera in orbit, streaming video constantly, so anyone can see it. You know, like this is the 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 size I think that they're looking for. Yeah. So all right, I shouldn't oh, yeah. say that too loud because then they're gonna start a Kickstarter. <laughs> You're gonna make me start the Kickstarter. Things happen, so you know, I mean, people are crowdfunding satellites now, and you know, mm -hmm. I mean, look at Arcids. I mean, with space telescopes, you could potentially do it on small form factors, but there's a lot of challenges. You know, right. I think if you look at like kind of Planet Labs with their constellation of gulfs, mm -hmm. I mean, they proved you could do it in a DU CubeSat, which is um, quite a bit bigger than pocket cubes, but maybe a, a large pocket cube, maybe three p. Um, you could take a, a kind of five centimeter diameter. Um, I don't know if that'd be any useful, like what sort of application that could be useful I don't for. Th I don't think it was meant to be like scientifically useful. I think it was a way to connect people with space. Right. Yeah. More of an outreach project, right? To the, here's yeah, space, yeah. here's the Earth all the time, live views. You know, just for the fun of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, they are they are all kind of cool concepts um, mm -hmm. for. Slightly, maybe not for cube, but like uh, for CubeSat, like exoplanetsat. So the mm. idea is that you have a constellation of uh, CubeSats which can detect extrasolar extra planets, um, which currently you can't do with one big Konkin satellite telescope. You need mm -hmm. the spatial, uh, and that's kind of where the killer app for these little guys is. is it's not doing one in isolation; it's doing right. hundreds or thousands of them, because you just do things that you just can't physically do with a big. Sure. Go off satellite. You know, it's this kind of. I'm not sure what the applications will be for, you know, like real time coverage of Earth. You know, tracking every wildfire on Earth. I mean, currently we can't do that. Yeah. You know, like huge for the insurance industry, huge for folks who have in uh, fire risk areas. You know, if you knew in real time where the fire was, you know, that'd be pretty useful. Um, things like that. It's sort of kind of commercial applications of that as well. So maybe not pop cubes, but definitely going on, and there's a lot of change going on. So. Yeah, I could see. Um Gosh, now you got me thinking radio interferometer in space. <laughs> right. yep. Radio interferometer in space. You send it out and uh, yeah, depending on your I guess if you're as long as you're pointing away from the earth, you're not seeing any of the man made signals, you're getting you could do like the, the dark ages reionization stuff at really low frequencies. Oh, that's very exciting. Okay. <laughs> that's yeah. exciting. Set up a constellation of of, uh, of of pocket cube radio telescopes. Ah, yeah, well, it's, it's dark every 45 minutes, so, you know, yeah. if you're in orbit, so, uh, it's, you know, and you're on, you're off, and you can only make power on the, the light side, so you that's store fine. up the power and then use it in the dark side, possibly, so. Oh, that's fine, just look at the background signal, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Cool. Um, so I'm going to check the comments one more time, see if there are any other questions uh, from you guys. I, put, I found the link to $50 sat, so I put that on there. Um, yep. And we also got a hello from Guido, who's watching from Germany, and thanking me for using metric <laughs> anytime. <sighs> boo, boo, not having the metric system in the U.S. Um, and uh, Andrew Planet just commented, uh, "Can we get Google to fund a live Google Maps or Google Earth? They'd be able to capitalize that." Yes, this is what I'm talking about. Google's got big pockets; yeah. they can field Earth monitoring stuff. <laughs> I'd vote for that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Um, I read an article in Wired a little few months back about companies that are looking at ways for real-time monitor. We don't have real-time monitoring of things on the Earth's surface, and it's like hugely important commercial data. Um, yeah. Even like you know, parking lots of of um, supermarkets, Gosh. you know, seeing what time customers are there. I mean, all that kind of data. Yeah, it's like Earth analytics, so you can like yeah, Earth <laughs> analytics. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. It's like you can like catch people like logging new. Um, deforestation real time and um, like they're talking about the financial markets where you know where all the ships are that are coming out of Africa yeah. for speculating on the, the price of corn things like that. This looks like kind of yeah. it's definitely a, a profit motive there so yeah. it's more likely it's happening than not. So. Yeah. Alright so um, okay so I'm sure oh, I'll take that down uh, so um, yeah so I think that's it for our questions um, yeah. I'm going to do <laughs> I'm going to, sorry, I just got a comment. What's $50 in metric? <laughs> Very <laughs> funny. <laughs> Very funny. Um, <laughs> if anyone watched the last episode of Archer, uh, there's actually a joke in there I won't repeat. Okay, so I'm going to do a few announcements, uh, and then we can wrap up, and you can give us um, 
maybe a last bit about Pocket Cube. Um, Friday. Friday is the Weekly Space Hangout. Fraser Kane is out of town. He's in Texas of all places. So I will be hosting the Weekly Space Hangout this week. So look out. It'll be a uh, shiny good time. Uh, we'll have our, our space journalists rounding up the astronomy space news for the week. That's at noon Pacific on Friday. Uh, that's the Weekly Space Hangout. The virtual star party comes up again at, uh, I think they're doing still doing 6.30 p.m. Pacific for the virtual star party on Sunday night. Uh, not sure whether Fraser will be back for that, but I'm going to try and pop in again since I had so much fun last week. And maybe they won't discover a supernova again. Um, Monday at the noon Pacific is Astronomy Cast with Pamela Gay and Fraser Kane. They record live on Google Hangouts on air. And then that brings us back around to Wednesday, next week's Learning Space. Uh, my co-host Georgia will be back, and we'll be talking with uh, one of the educators here um, in our town who does a really fantastic geology demonstration involving cupcakes. So we invited her just because we want to. No, it's really actually really cool, but we want cupcakes. Uh, that's part of it. So uh, yeah, that's our lineup for the week. Um, maybe we can get uh, some la a last comment from Tom about uh, what people should do, educators or anyone, if they're seriously thinking about um, doing a project like this. Yeah, I'd just sort of say um, read up about it, and if we can help in any way, we'll try our best. And um, it's the, these things are possible now. I mean, it's fairly new; it's, um, it's pretty bleeding edge. But you know, if you're if you're feeling ambitious and you want to give it a go, then it's it's doable. And um, you know, we'll try and help however we can. Um, we'll try and put you in touch with the right people and whatnot. Um, and you know, it's it's sort of early days on something that I think will be fairly big. Um, so it's always nice to get on the ground floor and um, people who buy in early definitely help everyone else because they kind of adopt it and you know before you know it the things start snowballing. So um, if you're interested then get in touch and uh, if you're interested you either put $50 sat or Ren or one of the other pop, uh, pop salads. Very cool. So check out Pocket Cube. Um, check out the website. It's Pocket Cube with a Q. Uh, and yeah. uh, check them out on Twitter, and uh, that is that sounds excellent. Now I'm thinking of things I want to put in space, and this is sure. may or may not be a good idea. So. All right, thank you everyone for watching, and thank you for joining this week's learning space. Bye everyone. Ah, okay. We're all back. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Learning Space. I'm your host, Nicole Gallucci, a postdoc with CosmoQuest. Uh, and I am joined this week by Tom Walkinshaw. So, hello. Hi. Uh, we are going to be talking about the Pocket Cube, which is a project uh, for sending satellites into space for a reasonably priced budget. Um, first, I uh, have a few announcement type things to do. Uh, unfortunately,